Welcome to Hindu Analysis, September 15, 2018. So today we are going to cover all these articles. So the first article is Pollution Cools Monsoon Days, Say Studies. So we all knew that the pollution is increasing day by day, thereby the global warming is also increasing. So we all knew that due to the increase in the global warming, lot of negative impacts is happening all over the environment. But the recent study by the researchers stated that it has some kind of positive effects in the environment. How? Which means the increased emission of the aerosols due to the pollution, that means it definitely increased the cooling effect of 1 degree Celsius. So this is what the recent study by the researchers suggested. That means all the vehicles which are emitting the pollution in turn increases the number of aerosol particles in the atmosphere. So those aerosol particle presence in the atmosphere lead to the cooling effect of the environment by means of 1 degree Celsius. So this is what the recent study stated. So if you see in this diagram the pollution by the industries from the vehicles everything lead to the accumulation of aerosol particles. Okay. So these aerosol particles are moving in the atmosphere and whenever uh, any water droplet or any water vapor from the surface of the earth rising to the atmosphere it got settled down over this aerosol that means uh, consider this is water so it evaporates and aerosol particles are present in the atmosphere so the water vapor when reaches a higher level so there by means of cooling that water vapor again converted into water particles and it got settled on this aerosol particles top okay so this led to the formation of clouds and this cloud even which in turn if it couldn't able to bear the weight of the water particles it started to rain so th that is how the precipitation occurs so this process is called convection process that is evaporation condensation and precipitation so we all knew that so if you see the basis of this process the aerosol particles which is present in the atmosphere that is the basis so what they conclude here is due to the pollution the aerosol particles in the atmosphere is increasing thereby it reduces the temperature of the atmosphere which means during the daytime it increases the cooling or it decreases the temperature similarly during the night time it actually increases the temperature so because of this difference in the recent uh, days that means especially during the monsoon period so the diurnal temperature difference is actually shrinking so what is this diurnal temperature difference means it is the difference between daily maximum and minimum temperature so if in a day during the daytime if it is 25 degree celsius that is a maximum and during the night time it is 20 degrees celsius then the diurnal is like 5 degrees celsius but now it is shrinking that means it is uh, coming nearer i mean 3 degree or 2 degree only is the difference so it uh, could uh, that means the diurnal variation could be due to cloud cover urban heat land use change as well as the aerosol particles and water vapor and the greenhouse gas which is present in the atmosphere so which in turn these are all affecting the uh, convection process as we see before this is the convection process right that means evaporation condensation precipitation so it affects that process and it only led, uh, led to the development of the clouds uh, in different different shapes and sizes and which in turn affect the rainfall pattern we already have seen right that means this aerosol particles presence changes the rainfall pattern itself because of the cloud formation so how means if you see in this picture it is the troposphere stratosphere mesosphere thermosphere etc and it is exosphere so the lowest uh, layer is the troposphere that is where the clouds are getting formed you see right so how this diurnal temperature differences as it getting decreased the lower layer of the atmosphere which is this troposphere it is reducing in height it is coming even closer to the earth's surface and more aerosols are getting into the atmosphere because it is now coming closer so there is an atmospheric turbulence which in turn affects the distribution of the moisture or the distribution of the water vapor which in turn converted into water particles and set settled on the aerosol right so it changes and it changes the rainfall pattern it even changes the shape and characteristic of the clouds itself so that uh, it affects the rainfall pattern so it causes sudden extreme rainfall but it weaken the monsoon rainfall so not only the study by the researchers shows these things but also it is matched with the recent satellite data of 10 year uh, nearly 10 year period so it also shows that the cloud structure is modified by means of increased aerosol emission and rain bearing clouds is also getting increased during the recent days so clouds tend to have higher number of ice particles which are very smaller in size if at all the aerosol loading is higher which in turn reduces the efficiency of the water droplet growth in the cloud 
cloud and it uh, leads to the rainfall if you see in this picture if the clouds are at higher level or if the clouds are at lower level what happens so if the incoming solar radiation hits the higher clouds then majority of the incoming solar radiation reaches the earth's surface and only a minute amount of in solar radiation is only getting reflected but similarly if you in case of lower clouds then the incoming solar radiation is maximum getting reflected back into the atmosphere and only a minimum level is reaching the earth's surface so this short wave radiation or the solar radiation is responsible for the heating of the earth's at earth surface so if the clouds are at lower level we see right that means most of the solar radiation is getting reflected back so the earth is cooling or earth gets cooled so this is what happening during the recent days due to the increase in the pollution by means of uh, emitting the aerosols so that is what the study researchers stated so if you go and zoom into this clouds it is nothing but the aerosol particles containing the water droplets okay so this water droplets if it reaches certain uh, low temperature or if it gets cooled it turn into ice particles and if that ice particles become wet then it started falling as either as a rain fall or i are either as a snowfall not only the incoming solar radiation but there is also outgoing long wave radiation which is reflected back from the earth's surface so mostly the clouds or cloud particles is affecting only the incoming solar radiation not the outgoing long wave radiation so this is why uh, there is an increase in the greenhouse gas emissions which in turn increases the global warming etc right so this cooling by the short wave radiation which surpasses the warming by the long wave radiation so this only results in the net reduction of the daytime temperature in the recent days especially during the summer monsoon so this is what the recent study stated so the second article is naco which is the national aids control organization releases a hiv estimation of 2017 report so this naco is under the ministry of health and family welfare and in that report what they stated is nearly 21.40 lakh of people are getting affected by hiv in 2017 and it was like 21.17 lakh in 2015 so it also added certain data like 87000 new hiv infections 9000 aids related death or taken place and 22675 mothers or needed anti retroviral therapy so that the mother to child transmission of hiv is not taking place so these are all represent how much worse the aids or hiv affected people are still prevailing in our society but our target is to ending the aids by 2030 so by means of stating these data what they are asking is is that possible that means achieving this target of ending aids by 2030 is that possible so if you see india is the world's third largest population of people with hiv and aids first is south africa and second one is nigeria so if you see the hiv characteristics in india then the hiv is not prevalent all throughout the country it is epidemic Uh, that means it's high only in certain geographical area and it is affecting only a certain population group similarly the rate of in the recent years if you see the rate of decline of the aids it is not that much good that means the rate of decline is also slower so these are all the concerns which is reflected by means of that data available uh, by the report and if you see further the states or the union territories which is having more hiv prevalence then the first is mizoram which is having the highest adult hiv prevalence in the total country and the second is followed by manipur then followed by nagaland telangana etc so these are all the states which is having the hiv prevalence even more than the national average so the national average is some certain x percent means then it is more than that so that is what the major concern so we have to take steps in order to eradicate all these things so if you see uh, in the recent united nations AIDS 2018 report they stated the new infections target should be like 47 percentage and AIDS related death should be like 51 percentage so it is like a national average which should be at attained by every country and we in case we attain 80 percent in new infections and 71 percent in AIDS related deaths by means of this HIV AIDS and control program though it looks good but if you see go deep into each and every state and its prevalent in Mizoram and Nagaland and all it is very high right so we have to take adequate steps there only in order to Uh, give the proper treatment to the people who are getting affected by aids so what is the way forward here is the government's contribution to the hiv programs needs to be increased more stocks of medicine to ensure no risk of treatment and aids as a public health threat that is awareness among the people should be created so the next article is indian air force ready for space challenge says air chief so the indian air force chief recently what he stated is 
the Indian Air Force and its arms are ready and geared up for supporting ISRO for its first Indian human space mission which is Gaganyaan of 2022. So what ISRO stated is 3% from the Indian Air Force will most likely to be chosen as the astronauts and they are trained at Institute of Aerospace Mission aerospace medicine and they are given the proper training for their fitness and psychological strengthening etc for the successful implementation of this uh, human space mission by India. So if you see the past achievement the first Indian cosmonaut who is Rakesh Sharma he is also he was the first Indian to reach space through this Soyuz T11 in 1984 mission. So it is now uh, the second one and it is the first Indian human space mission okay. So Gaganyaan if you see India is the only nation to send man directly to the space before experimenting with animals because if you see in case of Russia, US and Europe, China, all these countries first they tested with the animals then only they send the humans but now we are directly sending the humans first. So these are all some of the missions which is carried out by them by the other countries. So if you see in this picture this is the space vehicle it contains the crew model for three astronauts and the service model and the orbiter vehicle. So this mission duration is like seven days it contains two major things one is the emergency mission abort and crew rescue provision. So, which is recently tested, right? So, this is a crew escape system. So, this Gaganya is an Indian human space flight program and it will aim to carry three people and it launched to the space capsule by means of ISRO's GSLV Mac 3 uh, rocket or launch vehicle. And what this Gaganya will do is what is the plan is it will inject the spacecraft or this uh, space capsule into the orbit of 300 to 400 kilometer, which is a low Earth orbit. And its aim is to orbit the Earth for fewer times and safely return to the Earth for nearly like seven days it, it is going to orbit and recently ISRO has conducted its pad abort test that is the crew escape system if in case any emergency or failure occurs in this mission then the crew has to escape right so that is also successfully conducted so in that the entire spacecraft itself is getting ejected away from the launch vehicle and it was successful so the next article is family owned firms fare better this is by CSRI report so the recent Credit Suisse Research Institute analysis shows that the Indian family owned businesses are best in Asia and it is third largest market globally with 111 companies and similarly if you see first is the China second is the US so what they stated is more than 50% of top 30 performers of the all the companies so more than 50% is Indian family owned businesses in terms of both growth as well as in terms of profitability so they also stated that why this difference this because the non-family owned firms and if you compare with the family owned uh, firms then the average annual return of non-family owned is only six percentage but it is like 13.9 percentage which shows it it has a rate yield more return why because it is usually short term oriented but no, family means it is like hierarchical and hereditary right so it, it is usually long term and it focuses on uh, quality growth for the firms so this is the main reason why this is far better than the non-family so the next article is the supreme court transformed so this article majorly talks about the rights of the LGBTQ community. So we know two historic cases. One is this decriminalization of homosexuals, which is section 377. Another one is making transgender as a third gender. So these two things majorly ensures the rights of both the transgender community as well as the LGBTQ community. So now we are going to see the history of section 377 how it evolves so the first case is nas foundation versus government of delhi in that the delhi high court what they stated is treating consensual homosexual act between adults as a crime that is actually a violation of the fundamental right that means it is not a crime that is what the high court stated in 2009 so in 2013 Suresh Kumar Kausal versus Nas Foundation case, the Supreme Court overturned the High Court's uh, verdict stating that this uh, actually is a crime, that is consensual homosexual is also a crime. So that is what they stated. And in very recent year, that is in 2018, in Navtej Singh Zogar and others versus Union of India case, they again decriminalizes the homosexuality. That is, they actually reading down or cancel the section 377 itself. So these are all indicate that the Supreme Court actually acknowledges the voice of the most vulnerable sexual minorities within the LGBT community by uh, expanding the scopes of the rights which is enjoyed by each and every individual under Article 14, 19, 21, which is the right to equality, freedom etc and dignity okay so it is like a case which is uh, fighting between individual right versus collective right so it 
uh, that means this judgment makes individual as the heart of the constitution and so only the supreme court declared this uh, verdict okay even though the violence against the lgbt community is increasing on the one side before but the rapid movement by the lgbt community is also getting increased and the social acceptance for their concern is also getting increased so only this recent verdict uh, that is actually what is getting reflected in the recent verdict so uh, even though the LGBT community's concerns are addressed, the transgender persons are still marginalized and vulnerable and the violence against them is also getting increased. But they are now uh, actually addressed by means of these two cases, that is during the Nalsa and the Puttaswamy case, by means of ensuring transgender as the third gender and right to privacy as the fundamental right, the rights of the transgender people is now getting restored. So this is what they stated in this article. So what the article concludes here is, now the Supreme Court is actually transformed, which means it is now hearing the voice of the transgenders also, and they provide the solution for their concern. So the next article is reality different in leprosy free India says the Supreme Court so India was declared as leprosy free on December 31st 2005 itself but if you see the reality the national leprosy eradication programs data shows that only 543 out of 642 districts achieved the World Health Organization's prevalence that is this leprosy prevalence target as if a district or a state is having one for 10,000 uh, 10, persons, then, then only it is declared as the leprosy-free uh, state or district, but it is not yet achieved in reality. That is what the Supreme Court recently uh, raised its concern. So why? Especially because it is especially because of the underestimation of the leprosy cases as well as the declaration of the elimination of leprosy itself. So due to the underestimation and declaration of leprosy elimination, what happened is the funds which are actually meant for leprosy cases or removal or eradication of leprosy cases is now getting uh, diverted to some other uh, schemes or some other policies by the government. And still the because of that, the leprosy people are still continuing to suffer from the disease as well as from the stigma and even deny their fundamental rights to food itself and not issued the BPL court so they could not able to climb the benefits of the social welfare schemes and they even deprived of housing basic amenities and adequate sanitary facilities and rehabilitation programs etc so what the government should do now is it should be transparent about the disease and it should conduct periodical national surveys all throughout the country and regular and sustainable mazu awareness campaign should be ensured so that the people should be aware that there are some uh, medicines are available for the leprosy like MDT and it is freely available and it is able to completely cure the disease itself and also it should ban the use of the frightening images and instead it show the positive images of the cured people and they should also make aware the people that these people could also lead a very normal life and they can have children and can partic participate in social events etc and the patients especially the women and the children should not uh, should not face any kind of discrimination or isolation and this also should be ensured by the government and the children of uh, who are getting affected by this leprosy should be provided with free education and the bpl courts for the right to food should under right of persons with the disabilities act should also be ensured by the government so the next article is government moves to stabilize rupee so what the government recently trying to do is in order to stabilize the rupee that is our rupee is getting depreciated against dollar right now it is reaching like one dollar equal to 72 point some rupees so in order to stabilize the rupee depreciation either it has to increase the demand of the uh, Indian rupee or it has to increase the circulation of the dollar so these are the options available in front of the government so to achieve these two things what the government is trying to do is it suggested some five steps so we are now going to see each of these steps one by one so the first one is steps to cut down non-essential imports and increase the exports so government is trying to increase the exports and decrease the import thereby it increases the demand for the Indian rupee okay so this is one step so the second step is the F FPI's investment in a single corporate entity cannot exceed 20% of its corporate bond portfolio before. So now the government is giving some kind of flexibility that the investor can go exceeding 20% so that the incoming or the circulation of the dollar into the Indian economy by the foreign investors is getting increased. So this is the second way. So FPI cannot invest more than 50% of an issue of the corporate bonds. So this is also one thing that is 
before it was like uh, if uh, the fpa investor should not invest more than 50 percentage in the uh, indian companies or indian corporates because if they are going to invest more than 50 percentage then the management is going to their control so now it is also the government is giving some kind of flexibility so that the circulation of dollar increasing in the indian economy so the third one is the indian corporates to take the masala bond route so this masala bond means it is a rupee denominated instruments so this rupee denominated instruments is available only in the foreign countries and it it will be occurred by the indians uh, for their corporates okay so this masala bond route is now getting exempted from the taxes until March 2019. This is also to increase the circulation of the dollar into the Indian economy as well as to increase the demand of the masala bond or the rupee denominated bond or to increase the demand of the rupees. The fourth one is before there is a mandatory hedging condition for the infrastructure loans borrowed. So if an investor is going to get the infrastructure loan then in that certain X percentage it should uh, set aside and if in case it is not able to pay back the money or pay back the loan then that amount is going to get repaid by the investor but now that hedging is uh, kind of liberated that means no compulsion for the borrowers to hedge these loans okay so the last suggestion by the government is the manufacturing companies which are borrowing up to 50 million dollar through the ecbs so before they have a time period of three year term to repay the loan but now it is uh, the government is trying to reduce it to one year because the lenders or whoever giving the money to the investors so the lenders who are having the dollar denominator or dollar money right so now the lenders are more ready to give the loan to the investors so the last suggestion by the government is the manufacturing companies which are borrowing up to 50 million dollar through this ecbs so it is like before three year term that is only after three year term the manufacturing companies or the corporates have to repay the loan to the lenders but now it is uh, planning to reduce it to one year term which means after one year the manufacturing company or the corporate should repay the loan to the lender so this increases the interest of the lenders to uh, lend more okay these are all the steps put forward by the government in order to either increase the demand of the rupee or in order to increase the circulation of the dollars okay so the next article is beyond recompense on the ISRO spy case. So what the news here is, in 1994 espionage case, the former ISRO scientist S. Narayanan, so who was the director of cryogenic project as, at ISRO, so he was arrested allegedly for sharing, that means under the suspicion that he, he was actually sharing the secret information of the ISRO rocket engines to Pakistan, he was getting arrested. So even though the CBI proves that the case is false, the Kerala government again decided to reconduct the investigation. So again he approached National Human Rights Commission and they ordered uh, interim compensation of 10 lakh rupee and HC of that is the High Court of the Kerala is also direct the state to pay nearly like 10 lakh rupee and finally Supreme Court award 50 lakh compensation in 2018. So what the content here is. So it is like a disgraceful chapter in the history of police investigation, right? And it is like uh, he is actually battling for the restoration of his hon honor and dignity. And it draws a conclusion that compensation is not alone a remedy for the violation of the human rights. And there should be an oversight mechanism to ensure that all investigation into these crimes and compliance, it should be lawful. And justice is not only about relief and recompense, but also the extent of the action should be taken stringently against the person who are at the faulty side. So this is what uh, we are deriving at the conclusion from the espionage case. So the last article is the power games on the issues in the power sector. So what the news here is, we all knew that the RBA's FIP 12 circular, it stated that any uh, any firms or any power firms or any corporates which is getting the loan and if it is not repaying after 180 days, then it should be declared it as a non-performing assets and the IBC which is the uh, Indian bankruptcy code it should come and start its proceeding in order to either liquidate or uh, changing the management of those corporations or the firms so this is what the IBC actually aims at and this is what the circular stated but recently the Supreme Court stayed on the order that it stated that no action should be taken against the 
power firms because the power firms couldn't able to repay the loans not because of the internal factors or the internal functionality issues but it is because mainly of the external issues such as unreliable fuel supply unsustainable finances of the discoms as well as absence of meaningful price reforms so these external factors only affects the functions of the power firms not the internal factors so you should not take any action as of now so the supreme court just postponed it to november okay so this on the one hand actually it uh, gives some kind of relief to the power companies and shipping sugar and textile sectors but on the other hand it actually reduces the investor confident because there is no action is going to taken against the power firms by the ibc right so it is obviously going to reduce the investor confident so this is a concern so what we actually needed here is the structural reforms should be taken by the policy makers in order to uh, make the efficient functioning of these power firms so only if these structural issues are solved then only the banks can get the return else it is unlikely to make the money from the stressed assets even though the ibc comes and started its liquidation of the assets so everything is getting started banks are not going to get the return so what we have to do now is we have to make the structural reforms in the power firms that is what they stated So IBC also stated explicitly that if it is going to take the proceedings, then it will recover only one tenth of the due by means of liquidation of the assets. Okay. So the last article is Mahindra Group to go carbon neutral by 2040. So at recent Global Climate Action Summit, the Mahindra Group pledged to go carbon neutral by 2040. So how they are actually planning to achieve this target is by means of focusing on energy efficiency and making use of the renewable power in their manufacturing. They are the manufacturing vehicle manufacturing. Uh, corporates right so similarly the residual emissions are also been addressed by means of dumping it in through the carbon sinks we all knew that the carbon sinks right so the carbon is uh, trapped from the atmosphere and to sink under the ground so that is the carbon sink so no, now they are actually trying to do that also Uh, and also in the past they already doubled the energy productivity of the automotive business by means of using energy efficient lighting and efficient heating ventilation and air conditioning motors and heat recovery projects and all so they are very experienced in doing all these things efficiently so it shows a clear pathway for reducing emissions which is in line with the Paris Agreement's goal for limiting global warming to well below 2 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level. So we should take these as an inspiration, and we should get the technology transfer. And each and every industry has to uh, try to achieve the similar kind of target. So that is what they stated in this article. Thank you.